podcast. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. We come to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern on our satellite radio network and now on Exxon TV and around the world on Simul TV. If you'd like to give us a call, 1-800-610-7035, worldwide toll-free, email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Xzone Radio TV, and our website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. Is the world coming to an end? Well, this is a question that has been asked time after time after time after time. And it seems that in these very troubled days, more and more people are looking for explanations. What is really going on? Is the end of the world near? Are the prophecies coming to the end? Are we in the time, as talked about in the book of Revelations? Joining me this hour is a good friend of mine, Dr. Don K. Preston. This gentleman, to me understands the Bible like Napoleon did the Rosetta Stone. His website is www.bibleprophecy.com. And Dr. Preston, Don, welcome back to the X-Zone. Thank you, Rob. It's always an honor to be with you and a pleasure. Uh, tell me, Don, are we in the end days? I, I just don't believe that we are, Rob. I, I would, I would almost like to join the the, uh, <laughs> the hoopla, the paranoia, mm -hmm. and what have you. But uh, as, as I read the original records that we call the Bible, right? Uh, I, I just don't see any justification for saying that here we are, two thousand years later, and mm -hmm. that we're in the last days, when the biblical writers said they were in the last days, you know, two thousand years ago. They said the end is near, so we're not. What is going on with the rise of radical Islam? You know, we've seen the terrorist attacks in Paris. We've seen the uh, ISIS holding hostages, beheading them, trying to hold uh, countries, uh, you know, ransom. And, and it seems that no matter what the good guys try, still, we're not getting any further ahead. What's, what's the story behind the story, Don? Well, the story of Islam obviously goes back to the 6th century and the rise uh, of Islam at that mm -hmm. time, uh, and it's, it's very, very militant and very, very rapid uh, military conquest uh, of, the, uh, of the Arab nations and what have you. Uh, it, it, it is a, almost a constant story of military conquest. Now, I, I want to be absolutely objective. There mm -hmm. have been quite long periods of time in which Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived in perfect harmony with one another, uh, engaging one another, in, even in dialogue, even in debate, right. uh, without, without any of the violence. But the, uh, the rise of the jihadists who take their cue from the early days of Islamism uh, certainly seems to be gaining more and more traction. I heard one report just the other day that indicated there may be now, I found this stunning, but it, this one report indicated there may be as many as 100 million out of the tremendous number of, a uh, total number of Muslims, mm -hmm. maybe uh, up to as many as 100 million of them that actually ascribe to the jihadist mentality. That's frightening. Absolutely frightening. Why is it that it seems that when we look what's happening in Europe and we can see what's starting to happen in the United States, North America, and other places around the world, why can't we just live together? Why can't we just get along? Are they hell-bent on taking over the world and eradicating every other religion except Islam? 
They are. Uh, as a matter of fact, the jihadists are exactly that way. Let me go back to the fact that that's not always been true with mm -hmm. every single one of them. It is certainly not part and parcel of the entire Islamic uh, doctrine. Now, I've heard some former Islam uh, people say, no, that's not correct, that the major doctrine is world conquest. And let's face it, the word Islam doesn't mean peace, as some try to make us believe. It actually means submission. Oh. So that needs to be understood uh, very, very clearly that from a very fundamental level, submission is the key to the Islamic religion. I personally know right here in Little Ardmore, Oklahoma, uh, I've been friends with the local imam for some years now wonderful wonderfully gracious man mm -hmm. uh, he speaks very eloquently against the jihadist he says they are not true muslims etc etc okay i i can only take his word for it uh and he does lead a very very quiet and peaceful life but again the, on, on the flip side of that is the history that is undeniable and the question is, what do we do about that? All right, Don, we've got to take a commercial break. Please stand by. Exonation, Dr. Don K. Preston is our very special guest this hour. www.bibleprophecy.com. We'll both be back on the other side of this two-minute commercial break. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. This is The Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and now on Simul TV. It's great working with you again, Steve Turner. He's the president and CEO of Simul TV. And if you'd like to give us a call, toll-free, worldwide, 800-610-7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our website where you can listen to The Exxon, 724-365 www.exxonradiotv.com. Dr. Don K. Preston is our very special guest. We're talking about the rise of radical Islam. And Don, always great talking to you, my friend. Um, so where do we go from here? I asked you if, if in fact, their, the main objective of radical Islam is to eradicate every other religion and to have Islam as the only religion. Where do they rank as far as world religions? Well, they're obviously one of the fastest growing religions uh, in the world at this current time. What a lot of people do not recognize, however, is that in countries where the radical Islamists are not dominant, mm -hmm. uh, Christian evangelists are having tremendous success in converting Muslims to Christianity, really? at least one report that I have uh, seen on that. Uh, I have heard Christian missionaries uh, who have traveled to those such areas who have reported excellent success uh, in reaching out to Muslims, having excellent dialogue. And, and I'll share just a little bit of an anecdote. Sure. In, in, in 1979, I was actually due to go to Nigeria. And my host from Nigeria was from the southern part of the country. And as he was discussing our itinerary travel plans, he said, now, we will not go to the north. He said, in the north, the radical Muslims pretty well control things. Mm -hmm. And he said, they will listen to you unless they believe that you have insulted the prophet. If they, for any reason, believe that you've insulted the prophet, they'll kill you on the spot. But he said, here in southern Nigeria, we have excellent rapport. Mm -hmm. Muslims will engage in dialogue. They will sit down and study. They will look at the scriptures, both the Quran and the Bible. And we have great success in dialoguing with Muslims. Well, now, if, any, if you followed any of the movement of the Islamic movement in Nigeria, you know that the Muslim radicals have pretty well taken over uh, the entire country. Exactly. By the way, they, they not only took over the country, but they evidently uh, captured and killed my host. He literally disappeared off the face of the earth. You're kidding. No, no. And so... Uh, it, it's a very, very, obviously a very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. If we can get dialogue between Muslims and Christians, then progress can be made. But when the, when the conviction is held that if you 
if you question anything that Muhammad said, then you're insulting him, and therefore you're worthy of death. Then there, a whole lot of dialogue cannot take place. That's why historically, in areas where the jihadists have been, uh, shall we say, uh, a dominant or powerful force, the only way to deal with this has been military suppression. And you hate to think about such things, but historically, that has been the case. And so, as we face the future, mm -hmm. there can be real no compromise with the true jihadist, those who are, may I use the term, hell bent sure. on conquering the world, killing every Christian, every Jew, every uh, Hindu that refuses to, to submit. That's their that's their stated goal. They, you see the placards in their demonstrations, and the placards say to hell with public or with freedom of speech, mm -hmm. to hell with freedom, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's their view. There's no dialogue. There, there is no engagement. Now, I know personally of instances in which Christian uh, debaters have debated very prominent Muslims and actually converted those individuals to Christianity. The evidence is there. And... I am not what I would call an Islamic scholar or a scholar about Islam. I do know that there are certain things about it, however, that Christianity has a very clear, distinct, polemic advantage over. I'd be glad to share some of that. Uh, you know, if people want to contact me through the website there, BibleProphecy.com, because there are many, many sources out there today that those who are not Muslims who are being confronted with that challenge need to be aware of, need to educate themselves. One of the worst things that we can do is to, is to refuse or to fail to be educated about what Muslims honestly believe, what the response might be from that, not only from the Bible, mm -hmm. but from the Quran as well, and from their own history as well. Uh, without, without ever engaging in any kind of caustic, acerbic uh, kind of personal attacks on them or on Muhammad, but simply looking at, number one, the historical record. Number two, the testimony from the Quran. Let, let me give you a for instance of this. The Quran says Jesus was a prophet. Well, the Quran also teaches that if you uh, insult a prophet, then you're supposed to die. But Muslims today insult Christ. Where does that lead? <laughs> it seems like there's double standards. There most assuredly is a double standard. They, uh, here in America, Louis Farrakhan, uh, one of the most dangerous men in America as far as I'm concerned, I've listened to him on TV numerous, mm -hmm. numerous times. Uh, the last time I watched him, he stood up and said, Jesus was a lying dog and a false prophet. How can you Ten get away with that? How can you get away with it? I don't know. What astounded me was the camera panned on the first two rows of the audience. Right. And they put down the names of some of the men, of the men on the front row. They were leaders of, ministers of, some of the leading Methodist and Baptist churches in the town in which he was speaking. Not one of them acted like they were angry. Not one of them acted hurt or insulted that this man that they were sitting there listening to was calling Jesus a liar and a dog. That's troublesome to me. Uh, if someone that I've invited to speak at my place gets up and calls Jesus a liar and dog, I'm going to have some things to say about that. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I will not sit there uh, blank-faced and nod my head mm -hmm. Like, this is a great man speaking. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So this is extremely troublesome. So here, here is Louis Farrakhan, who is a part of the Islam nation. And Islamism says Jesus was a prophet. Yet here he calls him a false prophet. Well, which is it? And by the way, in Islamic eschatology, Jesus is supposed to come again and help rule the world. Well, actually, he'll rule for 40 years and then he'll die in the Islamic eschatology. But the point of it is, they believe that Jesus is coming back. Well, if Jesus is coming back in God's plan, how can you turn around and call him a false prophet, a dog, and a liar? Are we sure, are, are we sure we're talking about the same God when we talk about the God of Islam and then the God of the rest of the world? Boy, that's a really excellent 
question, Rob. Many people say, well, Allah is mm -hmm. the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down Moses, and what right. have you. And I know that Muhammad made that affiliation. But in regard to theology, there is such a distinct dichotomy between what I read mm -hmm. uh, in the Quran as Muhammad describes his attitude toward men, his requirements of men, etc., versus the God of the Bible, uh, especially when I come to the New Testament. You know, the, the, the God of the Quran is not a God of mercy and grace. He is not a God of love. I know some Muslims will disagree with that. But the, uh, the, the retributive side of Allah is not the God of grace that is depicted through the man Jesus Christ. So who is their God? Well, once again, they, they claim that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham certainly plays a, an incredibly important role mm -hmm. in the Quran. There's no question what, about that particular thing. But let's remember that Muhammad didn't come along for 600 years after Jesus. Right. So, it, so it's somewhat, I would call it disingenuous to say that this religion sprang from uh, Abraham, mm -hmm when the lineage really is not there. The lineage is from Abraham th to Jesus. It is not from Abraham to Muhammad. So there is a very, very distinct delineation in regard to source of religion, uh, source of founding. Jesus, is, there are two genealogies, one in Matthew, one in Luke, mm -hmm. which incidentally the first century Jews never questioned in any way, shape, form, or fashion so far as where I know of. I do not know of a single first century Jewish polemic attack on the genealogies of Jesus. Well, again, those genealogies trace right up to Jesus. He is of the lineage of Abraham. Muhammad wasn't. He is not of the true lineage of Abraham in that regard. He traces the religion of the God of Abraham back to him, but not through lineage. Where or when does the Bible and the Quran start separating, becoming two distinct religious philosophies? <clears throat> wow. That, that's an area that I'm still investigating, yeah. Rob, because it, it's a question that I, I personally want to be able to more definitively mm -hmm. say, okay, at this particular point in the theology of Islamism, right. they diverge radically mm -hmm. from the God of the Bible. Big time. Now, uh, major big time. Yeah. Now, in, in the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice, you begin to see some divergence. Mm -hmm. The further down the line, historically speaking, uh, you begin to see, and, and one of the things that ho has always been very frustrating to me in my somewhat limited dealings uh, with Muslims and in trying to engage them in dialogue is that they have such a humongous resistance toward accepting the testimony of the New Testament. Well, I accept the New Testament as the inspired Word of God. Sure. And so where they come along, and my exasperation is, if we have testimony, let's say from Paul, uh, they just feel totally free to say Paul was a liar. Paul was not a true prophet of God. Paul was, a, uh, was an innovator, so to speak. And therefore, I don't accept the writings of Paul. Or even in the Gospels, they make very unsubstantiated claims when, for instance, the book of John, the Gospel of John, tells about Jesus dying on the cross. Hold that thought, Doctor. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation, Dr. Don K. Preston is my very special guest this hour, www.bibleprophecy.com. If you'd like to send us an email, exon at exon Radio TV on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV and our main website where you can listen to the Exxon 724 365 Dr. Don K. Preston and I return after this news break from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away.
Dr. Don K. Preston is my special guest this hour, Exonation, www.bibleprophecy.com. Let me let me let me ask you something, Don, before we get back. This just came to me as you and I were coming back to air. It seems that when you look at the Bible, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is very strict, vengeful, demanding. Look what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what he did to the world. Is it possible that the God that that radical Islam or Muhammad preached about and wrote about in the Quran is based on the God that we read about in the Old Testament and that the kind, loving God that gave his only begotten son to this, to this earth to teach us the way is the, is, is, is the God that we revere. We love. Could could this have something to do with it, Don? I think it has everything to do with it, and I don't know that we've got enough time on this <laughs> and the rest of the program for me to develop this. But but one one of the great objections to Christianity that mm-hmm. has been offered is look at the look at the cruel, vindictive, wrathful God of the Old Testament. Yeah. You do you mean to tell me that we're supposed to worship a God that would send the Israelites into a land and say kill every every living person in there? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just can't worship a God like that. I think it fails to understand that the record of the Old Testament was of a God who was trying to teach man something very, very powerful, and that is that living by the sword is not the way to live. Right. And that, look look at all the carnage, look at all of the suffering that comes through military conquest, geopolitical uh, conquest, Mm -hmm. uh, nations that are focused on obtaining of wealth, obtaining of more territory, etc., etc. Now, here's where it gets very, very, very interesting. Okay. The New Testament sets forth the examples of things that happened in the Old Testament as and it uses a Greek word, tupos, Mm -hmm. which is translated as type. The word type can signify a foreshadowing, okay? And it it is a type of prophecy. Let me give a quick example. Uh, When Yahweh was going to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage, he said, you kill a lamb that is perfect, it's spotless, blah, 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 the Passover lamb. Well, when we come to the New Testament, we read of Jesus being the Passover lamb. Well, the initial, literal, physical Passover lamb was a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, not to deliver us from bondage from a geopolitical nation, but to deliver deliver man from bondage to himself and to sin. So, in the Old Testament, Yes, God did create those nations and say, beat your plowshares into swords. Go out and win. Go out and conquer. But all the while, what was being instructed, what what was being communicated there was, you know what? It doesn't matter what you conquer. Somebody else will come along and conquer it from you. It is a world. It is a kingdom of futility. And those things happened as types. So we come to Jesus when he appears, and whereas under the Old Testament, if a king was in danger, what did all of the what did all of his followers do? They drew the sword and they fought. Right. They defended him. Jesus is in the garden. Here come the Roman soldiers. They're about to take Jesus. Peter draws a sword, going to defend his king, just like always always under the old covenant. And cuts off a man's ear, <laughs> Jesus reaches down, puts the ear back on, which I'm pretty sure that fellow was through for the night, by the way. <laughs> I guess. But Jesus told Peter, put up your sword. The one who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Peter could have said, but Lord, you're our king. Our kings in the past, we've always defended them with the sword. And Jesus said, but I'm here to show you that didn't work. 
So the old covenant and the examples and the kingdom examples that we have there are very powerful examples, teaching examples that God gave through a long series of time to be sure to show man the futility of living by the sword. Right. Living by force, living by greed, living this way and that. And so Jesus comes to say, you know what? That old covenant kingdom back there foreshadowed a different kind of kingdom. And so Jesus, standing in front of Pilate, that we know historically was absolutely, totally paranoid about any perceived threat against his own procuratorship or governorship, rather, mm -hmm. and that of uh, the rule of Rome. We know of thousands of people that he killed needlessly, but he was paranoid. So he's got this guy standing in front of him who the Jews are saying, ah, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. And Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Now, I'll guarantee you, had Jesus said, I'm here to fight you, Pilate, my soldiers, my followers are gathering swords even now, there would have been a bloodbath in Jesus' followers that night. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. My kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus himself sets forth a radical dichotomy between the kingdom that he came to establish, a kingdom that was in fact foreshadowed by the old, but which when it existed under the old, manifested nothing but constant futility. Violence begat violence. And Jesus said, I've come to show you something far better. I believe the problem, uh, number one, atheists have never seen this issue. They've never seen that the old covenant kingdom of violence was never God's intended permanent uh, form of kingdom. Never was. Just like animal sacrifice was never God's intended form of worship. Uh, the book of Hebrews tells us, in sacrifices and burnt offerings and in offerings for sin, I have had no pleasure. Well, for crying out loud, they stood for 1,500 years, mm -hmm. okay? But God was constantly showing them, you know, guys, you know, let, let's just face it here. Any thinking, logical person would understand what the book of Hebrews meant when it said the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. Okay, well, if I can look at killing a bull and knowing, you know, I'm the one that robbed my neighbor uh, so killing the bull's going to take care of that. <laughs> cool deal. <laughs> I'll go rob another neighbor and I'll offer another bull. No, wasn't very effective. Wasn't very effective at all. So once again, that old covenant form of the kingdom was for a teaching world. And the Muslims, especially the jihadists, Ne have never realized the futility of that form of kingdom. They're looking to establish the earthly kingdom that is won by force, maintained by force. But God was pointing the way all the time to a different kind of kingdom, the kind that Jesus said is not of this world, and Paul, as he proclaimed that kingdom, and people were getting all bent out of shape, well, do I eat this meat, or do I do this, or do I do that? And Paul said, look, guys, uh, the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink. It's not like the old covenant kingdom, in other words. It is in love, joy, peace, and righteousness. Radically, radically different from the Mosaic covenant kingdom and the Islamic kingdom. But when you look at history, Don, Islam has been at war with every other religion since its conception. Yes. Why does why would anyone in today's society think that it's going to change until there is a an Armageddon type confrontation between Islam and the other religions of the world that get along, believe don't treat women like second-class citizens. Oh. They don't abuse each other in the name of religion. What's it going to take? 
I really believe, and I've said this often, I believe I said it on, on the last program that I was with you, Rob. I believe that, number one, the Muslim countries have, have to come to grips with their own internal problem. Mm -hmm. Now, we saw something very refreshing in Egypt just recently. They kicked the Muslim Brotherhood out. Yeah. Unfortunately, here in America, we have a president that embraces the Muslim Brotherhood. Don't get me started on that problem, but the the new military president. You don't you don't always like the idea of a military president. A pre right. President, I, I understand that, but he said there has to be a revolution in our cultural world mm -hmm. to realize we cannot tolerate the radical Islamic movement. Now, here is a, here is a Muslim leader saying radical Islamism is dangerous to us as Muslims. And he said, we're going to stamp it out. Okay, it's refreshing to see that. And even though Jordan has been drifting toward more of a, more of a radical uh, tilt, yes. unfortunately, there are still very, very strong forces in Jordan that are saying, no, 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 that will destroy our nation. We must fight this radicalism. Mm -hmm. So, number one, the, the Islamic world has to confront internally the, the existence of this cancer in, in their own ranks. Now, this is very difficult. And I know it's very difficult. Uh, number one, they might fear for their life if they uh, if they speak up against it. <clears throat> number two, they're going to have to start having some major polemic encounters um, in the Islamic world, debates between jihadists and non-jihadists saying, here's what the Quran actually says. The Quran condemns your radicalism if they're willing to do that. I would love to be able to see... I would love to start seeing some of that kind of intellectual warfare in the, Isla in the Islamic world. Secondarily, unfortunately, from a geopolitical and military perspective, historically the only way the Islamic factions have been controlled is exactly that. They've been controlled. They have been suppressed so incredibly through military actions that they were unable to present a major, major problem. And when you have countries, for instance, like France, who is allowing their no-go zones, the enforcement of Sharia law, uh, and which, by the way, efforts have even been made right here in America, in Minnesota, to allow Muslim communities to set up their own no-go zones and establish Sharia law right here in the United States of America. Now, it hasn't been successful so far, so but far. efforts have been made. And it's scary. What about these, these, these towns that are popping up? For example, uh, what is it called? Islamburg? Islamburg, New uh, York, in the Catskills? Something like that, yes. And, and though, that, that's nothing but an attempt to circumvent uh, you know, the, the laws of America to establish Islamic communities. I mean, after all, if, uh, if you're a non-Muslim and you're going to Islamaburg, mm -hmm. uh, you may want to think say, thought long and loud or long and seriously before you actually go into town. And that's exactly, again, it's what's happened in France. Britain has a major growing problem with the exact same thing yep. with areas of London that are basically taken over by the Muslims, and they warn you, and don't yet, go there. And yet, there, uh, Bobby, what's the name of the, the governor from Mississippi or Alabama? Bobby Jindal. Bobby Jindal. Right, he went over there, and he was telling the media about these areas that where the police will not go because it's under Sharia law, and every member of the British Parliament and law enforcement agency that, that he talked to said that's, that's a bunch of bunk. They don't exist. So, so, and yet when we saw what happened in Paris, when we, when we see what mainstream media doesn't want us to see, it's a totally different world. And I, I've said this a long time ago, Don, we're too politically correct. <laughs> we're way too politically correct. You know? I, uh, I see echoes of Neville Chamber 
Chamberlain everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's appeasement. We we don't want to offend. And look, uh, I am a person that's pretty easygoing. I don't go out of my way certainly to uh, to offend uh, yeah. any person of of the Islamic faith. I'm more than happy to engage them, mm -hmm. to share my faith with them. I don't want them putting a gun to my head because I I do not believe that Muhammad is prophet is God's prophet. Yeah. And I don't believe they ought to have that right. I believe they ought to be, quote, controlled to such an extent that they would think long and hard before ever doing anything like that. What? But again, I'm all for dialogue. Sure, but what would happen if any other religious philosophy was to try to get away with what Islam is getting away with? Well, I keep coming back right here in America, and of course you're in, you're in Canada, yeah. and, and efforts have been being made uh, in Canada to, to control the freedom of speech to, yep. to a great extent. <coughs> Pardon me. Right here in America, uh, the uh, Newsweek magazine came out just recently and made the statement that they would not show any images of uh, Muhammad. Uh, they certainly would not uh, show any of the cartoons that were so offensive to the Muslims because they said, we made a, an editorial decision that we're not going to publish pictures that are uh, religious or offensive to the religious sensibilities of yeah. readers. It's only been a few years back that they ran in their magazine pictures of a crucifix in a bottle of urine. Yeah, yeah and, and here, here's something else. Even CNN, who I used to have a lot of respect for, would not, would not run the new cover of Charlie Hebdo. Yes. And yet they'll run everything else. Don, stand by. We've got to take our final break for this hour. Dr. Don K. Preston is my special guest explanation. He's got a great website, www.bibleprophecy.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Explanation, Dr. Don K. Preston is our special guest this hour, www.bibleprophecy.com. First of all, Don, always great talking to you. Great seeing you, my friend. Likewise. Where, Likewise. Do, where do we go from here? How can, can we bring this to a peaceful resolve? With a certain element uh, of the jihadists, no. They, they will not sit down. They will not negotiate. Their, their stated policy, their stated goal is the destruction and the death of every Christian that will not recant, every Jew that will not recant, every Hindu that will not recant, every unbeliever that will not become a believer. There cannot be peace when, when someone says, you either convert or die. Right. And so the only peaceful resolution to that is to suppress that philosophy to such an extent that they cannot impose their will on us. But I, how... I, don't, I, I wish that I had an easier solution to that. Mm -hmm. But historically, there is no other solution to that. Education is the key for those who are perhaps attracted to that. This is where, to reiterate, I think there has to be a polemic exchange within Islam itself uh, of the leaders of the peaceful elements of Islam to confront philosophically, quote, scripturally, to use their own scriptures, mm -hmm. uh, and, and through through their synagogues, to use that term, uh, but through their temples to instruct their young people. This is not Islamism. This is not the truth of, of Muhammad. And if you're going to go that route, you will be, you will be expelled. We, w we will not allow that. And it's going to take a major cultural religious revolution in Islamism itself. Those of us who are believers on the outside are going to have to be more willing to engage. A man such as James White, a man for whom I have a great deal of, uh, of respect, has been very successful, by the way, in debating Muslims. And there needs to be more of that type of intellectual conflict, intellectual exchange, because there are, I am convinced, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of good, honest Muslims who don't really even know 
the other side of the story. They don't really know the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But when they hear that story and the stark contrast between Allah and the, and the God of, depicted through the life of Jesus, a God of love, mercy, and grace and forgiveness, what, a, what an incredibly wonderful contrast it is. You know, look, Rob, I'm convinced that we as human beings, we know very good and well that we are flawed. We need some help. Sure. Allah, Allah does not offer that in the same gracious way that Jesus offers that through love. And it, it is a totally different story with Jesus than it is with Allah. The story of Jesus is a story not of threats, not, not of danger, not of the sword. It is a story Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, yeah. and I'll give you rest. That's a beautiful invitation. Don, as always, a great pleasure talking to you, my friend. Great seeing you. Thanks for coming on the show, Don. Thanks for all the great things you do. And you know what? You, you, my, you, my friend, are a light in life. Thank you very much. It's always an honor to be with you. Look forward to being back. Tell our listeners how they can find out more about you, Don. Go to my website, www.bibleprophecy.com. My contact information is on there. If you have questions about anything that I've said uh, tonight, if you want more information, uh, let me plug one book here, Rob. It sure. is entitled The Last Days Identified. Lots and lots of folks saying, well, the rise of Islamism proves we're in the last days. No, get my book, The Last Days Identified, and you'll see there's no merit whatsoever to that We'll have claim. to have you back on in the next week or so to talk about your new book. Don, take care of Thanks. yourself, and my very best to your wife, and I hope she's feeling better soon, my friend. Thank you very much. Exo Nation, Dr. Don K. Preston has been my guest this hour, and we'll be back on the other side of this commercial break. Don't go away.